of Spartans of that. This scripture, this scripture is a, a scripture that is just very pointed and not accepted by many at that time. And not accepted by many, or I should say there are many that don't accept it today. Let's read it. It's found in Mark 12, chapter, or verses 28 through 34. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them de debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is most important, which is most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied, you are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all of your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him, any more questions. It's interesting that the lawyers, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes have all gotten together and they found and, and put down in their book of statutes, which has a name we won't get into, but 613 <coughs> statutes that the good Jew was to know and to keep. And these rabbis, though, uh, would divide them somewhat after much debate on which were the greater down to the lesser, which ones were the most important, and which ones were the least important. So this, this uh, teacher of the law came to Jesus and wanted to hear his take on this discussion. He said to him, uh, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Which one is the most important? It sounds that Jesus didn't even have to think about it for a second and quickly came out with the answer. It's this. Hear, O, o Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That was the first thing he said. Now that's called, if you were a Hebrew, you would probably say Shema, and some say Shema, S-H-E-M-A, if you're a hillbilly from southern Ohio. <laughs> Which there's not a whole lot of those here. I can think of two. <laughs> and uh, this is still important. See, the, the conservative Jew in Jesus' day the first thing they did when they got up in the morning is recite this. The last thing they did before they went to bed at night, they recited this. And at the beginning of every service in the synagogue, they started the service what? With the Shema. They, they started with this scripture. And it's, of course, found in uh, Deuteronomy Chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. And then he went ahead and finished it. He says then that, uh, and you're to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. I'm going to get to that in just a little bit. And with all your strength. That's the first one. That's the greatest commandment, says our Lord and Savior. That's it. The second, which he wasn't asked for, but he gave anyway, was this. Much shorter. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, why would he say this? 
Well, actually, what he has done and what the scripture has done, and, and, and by the way, that's found in Leviticus 19, 18. And what he did was he kind of used this to condense the first four commandments that had to do with our vertical relationship, us with God, God with us, these four. The last six had to do with a horizontal idea of neighbors and friends, others, other people. They don't, you don't steal from them, you don't murder them, you don't covet and so on. And, and so, in a sense, in a very general way, he covered the Ten Commandments. I thought it was interesting that he started out with the love of God and then finished with our love for others. And love was at the very center of both of these commands. I like this. Next verse. The lawyer said, you're right. Well, isn't that good? The Lord of the universe and this lawyer pronounced it right. You're right. These lawyers, I don't, oh, wait a minute. They weren't the kind our lawyers are. They're not like our lawyers. These are lawyers of the law. Our lawyers would never do anything like that. What's bad is they don't have equal time right now. So. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, I, it's just ironic, and I don't think he meant it in that way. He was saying, I agree with you, but to, but to tell the Lord himself, the Lord of the universe, that, well, you're right there. You got that one right, sir. I thought was a lot. But then he said, these are more important than all the law or all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. That's big. That's going beyond agreeing with Jesus. He already said, you're right. Jesus, you have answered correctly. That is the right interpretation of these laws. That is the right interpretation of Scripture. You're exactly right. But then he went ahead to say something that Jesus did not say. And I want to tell you, this lawyer was exactly right. And Jesus essentially in the last verse said, this lawyer is exactly right. This, this idea of having no other God before you. You see, every other country in the world at that time had other gods besides one. The contribution of the Israelites to the world history scene was their belief in one God, monotheism, one God. The rest of the world back then and much of the world today have a belief in many gods, in many gods. But the Hebrews said, no, I believe what God says. I believe that Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, is the one God. That wasn't accepted by the world in large at that time. And guess what? It's not accepted by the world at large today. Many of the religions of the world have many, many gods. And yet, the Bible tells us that this man went on ahead to say, that's not all. We ought to love one another. That's very good. And these two together are much more important than burnt offerings and sacrifices. And that's quite a leap for a Jew. When their whole life, their whole religious life, the fact that they felt that they could live with their sins forgiven and washed and so on was all done by the blood of sacrifices. It was the sacrifices that as they were given on the day of atonement by the, the high priest and then the, the sacrifices given by the family worship by the head or patriarch of those particular families and the times they would come to the temple for sacrificing or for the holy days. It was the worship, the temple feast, 
the week-long festivals and the sacrificial system uh, there at the temple that defined Judaism at that time. And this lawyer rightly said, those aren't as important as you thought they were. The most important things is that you understand that God is God. And you worship him as God. And as the only God. And the second most important thing is you love him with all of your heart and soul and mind and so on. And the third thing is that you love everyone else. That's it. That's pretty simple, isn't it? That's not too complicated. I've told you before about a young man from Sierra Leone, uh, uh, Leone who uh, had become a Christian. And uh, he was about 18, 19, 20 years old. I met him at a camp. And he said, you know, a lot of the missionaries make Christianity so complicated. The one reason that Islam was growing so fast at that time, and this was many years ago in Sierra Leone, is because they make it so simple and the people could understand it. Well, how much more simple could it be made than I've made it right here because of using the scriptures? To come to Christ as our Lord and Savior. To love him with all of your heart and mind. To serve him exclusively. And to love one another as your very self. All the religiousosity, word I made up, I like, but it, you can use it. I'm going to allow you to use religiousosity. It's a compromise from church entity, which I normally use. But all those things pale the way we worship is always a big dispute among churches and so on. The, the, the doctrine is always disputed among the churches, the doctrine, the teachings. I went to a seminary and they were just paranoid about the, the president would often speak to us. It was always about getting the doctrine right. What got me, as I've told you this before, 60 miles down the road was a very good seminary filled with all kinds of Armenians, Asbury Theological Seminary. They wouldn't have agreed with half what we were being taught, nor would the other way around at our Baptist seminary, who uh, thought Calvin was everything, and they wasn't all that convinced of it down at Asbury. But that doctrine... You know, that, that belief, the, the way we do things. So this is what church is all about. And that lawyer, bless his heart, said that's not what it's about. It's about what's going on in here. It's about what's going on in the heart. It's about who we love and what we love and how we love. It's about loving God with all of your heart. And we as Christians do this through Jesus Christ. It's about loving those around us. And we as Christians, quite frankly, probably don't do that enough. And yet that's what it's all about. Oh, it's great to have good doctrine. I, I, I'm so glad that my doctrine is pretty much perfection. <laughs> and all the other people that believe different than me, I let them do that, but they just don't know. And, and I understand that. And I'm so magnanimous about it. And so I want to sum all this up. And, and I'd like to do it, first of all, with mentioning just a little bit what it means to love the Lord with all the heart. Now, what is the heart? Well, it's not this pumping organ, so you can forget that. And a lot of definitions of heart, I'm not going to give them to you. I'm going to give you a, 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 at least one. I see heart in this case as your passion. I know the seed of emotions. I know all those death, But I love passion. What is your passion? Well, that's what is your heart. That's what's in your heart. It's your passion. We talk about an athlete. That athlete, he, he, that athlete was great. He kept giving it his all even in the face of a loss. And somehow or another, he just gave everything he had. He gave his whole heart. He gave his whole heart to what he was trying to do as a great world-class athlete. I had a little... Brittany Spaniel, when I came here, and bless her heart, she, was a, she had the heart of an athlete. 
she would hunt until she couldn't hardly walk. It was my job to call her off so she could rest and stop her. I think she would have hunted herself to death. She loved treats, and I would always give her treats. She loved them, but when she was hunting, I'd offer a treat to boister her up a little bit and all, and she wouldn't even look at it because she was hunting. And that's why she was there. And she did that with all of her heart. The only time she ever disobeyed me is when I tried to call her out of the field. It was fields there. We hunted for pheasants. Out of the field to get her in the car to take her home. And then she would dodge me. She would act like she wasn't there. She would get in weeds this high and stand real quiet so I couldn't see her. She would find every way in the world not to come to the car. That was her heart. To love God with that heart. Just like that is what he's asking. And then the mind. The mind's a little easier. Mentally, we need to know what we believe. We do need to know what doctrine's about. We do need to know this, but it's not the number one thing. But we need to love him with our minds as well. To learn all we can learn about the, the scriptures. To learn all we can learn about the Lord. To love him with our minds. And then our soul. The soul is kind of the hardest one. Hard to define. We all know what it is, but it's so hard to, to define. I define it as the true you, the true you, the self. What makes you self? You say, I myself. What is self? Is it just your hands, and your, your head, your body? It's more than that, isn't it? Is it just your passion, your heart? It's more than that. Is it just your mind? It's, it's more than that. It's you. It's the true you. It, it's the self, and I love this little wording that I read when I was studying for this message. It's that part of you that has a yearning for God. I'd never read that before. I grasp onto that. That part of you that yearns for God. And, and, and that's the soul. And he says to do it with all of your strength. That means intensity. And that means with your energy. Secondly, back to that idea of the most important of all things. The most important, more important than burnt offerings and sacrifices. More important than religion. More important than doctrine. More important than your opinion. King Saul was told of God to go to this enemy's city and basically destroy it. The people, the animals, the king, the whole thing. Now how you feel about that, we can talk about some other time. But that's what the orders were. King Saul came back with the king in a box or a cage and all the animals. And after he got caught with them, he said, oh, I, I was bringing these animals to sacrifice. And the prophet of God came to him and said, Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience to God is better than sacrificing every one of those lambs and sheep and goats and all that they were. Every one of them. You could sacrifice them all. But to have obeyed God about this, and it was the beginning of the end for Saul and his kingdom. Finally, why did it say you are not far from the kingdom of God? What, what was left? What was left yet? He said all these things are right. He went beyond what Jesus said, and what he said was right. And Jesus appreciated them as being right. But he didn't say, you're now into the kingdom. He said, you're not far from the kingdom. What did he have to do yet? That was to accept Jesus Christ and allow him to be your Lord and your God. Now, I get chastised for doing that from time to time, but I'll never quit doing it. So if you're one of the chastisers, you might as well quit. But I have to announce to those who don't know 
perhaps the Lord Jesus. Perhaps everyone in here knows the Lord, and I hope so. But you know, if we don't, we need to, because that's the final step. They hadn't walked across, he hadn't walked across that threshold where he was not just willing to tell Jesus he was right, but to say, Jesus, you're my Lord. He hadn't done that yet. That's what he needed to do. That's all he had left to do. Jesus, I'm going to follow you. Jesus, I'm going to make you my Lord. And that's what he wants us, that's what he wants us to do. I, I thought about that loyalty and I thought about how one of the most honored things is loyalty. When I was a basketball, varsity basketball coach, I could basically pick out my associates who I wanted to coach on the reserve team or junior varsity, who I wanted to coach at the middle school, who I wanted to coach in the seventh grade team, the eighth grade team, the freshman team. What was my main criteria? How much they knew? Was that it? No. I could teach them. I could teach them my system. I wanted to teach them my system. I wanted it to be my system. That way they'd be on the right page and when they came up to me on the varsity level, they would already know the system. I looked for people that were loyal. That were loyal to the program and who else? Me. Yeah. I, d I wanted them to have a varsity job someday. What didn't I want them to have? Mine. <laughs> I'd tell my sisters, you're going to make a good coach someday. Not at this high school. Until I'm done, maybe. But someday. I wanted them to be. The best news I could have was when they got a job. A varsity job somewhere. It was great. But I wanted loyalty. God wants loyalty from us. That's what he wants. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day. Lord, for this opportunity to preach your word, to teach your word, and now bless us in the Lord's Supper that we honor you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.